Hello, everyone, and welcome to a conversation about IFSAS 47, Revenue. My name is Edwin Ng, and I'm a principal at the IFSASB. With me today is Eileen Zhou, who is also a principal at the IFSASB. So, Eileen, the IFSASB had a very exciting start to 2023. Yes, the IFSASB approved several new standards a few weeks ago uh, during the IFSASB meeting in Washington, D.C., which included the new standard on revenue, IFSAS 47. And so the IPSASB and the staff are all very excited for entities to start applying this new standard. So as a starting question, we already had a lot of guidance on revenue before in the IPSAS. There were three standards, actually. So why did the IPSASB decide to go down this route and develop a new revenue standard? That's a good question, Edwin. There are a few reasons. The existing three revenue IPSAS were originally issued in the 2000s, and that predated the IPSASB's conceptual framework, which was issued in 2014. And so a review was a good idea just to consider whether or not those revenue standards are consistent with the conceptual framework. But there were a few other reasons as well. One, uh, constituents had noted that there were application issues with some of the existing revenue IPSAS, in particular IPSAS 23, which was the revenue standard for non-exchange transactions, taxes, and transfers. The second reason, uh, to in, in addition to this, is that the ISB issued IFRS 15 in 2014, which replaced its existing revenue standards and related interpretations. So there was really a good opportunity there to evaluate the accounting requirements that the board had for public sector revenue transactions. So constituents might remember that back in 2020, the OBSASB released three exposure drafts, two on revenue and one on transfer expenses and those exposure drafts mirrored each other. So can you give us an update on what happened to those? So the IPSASB received over 200 comment letters in response to the EDs. The board diligently considered these comments and focused on identifying and clarifying the core principles to account for revenue transactions and being consistent in principle with the accounting principles in the transfer expenses standard. Overall, the board wanted to ensure that the principles would allow entities to reflect the substance of the transactions themselves. Now, all of these discussions essentially culminated in this single revenue IPSAS, IPSAS 47, to replace the existing three IPSAS. IPSAS 47 is now a single source of guidance to account for revenue transactions in the public sector. And the board wanted to ensure that it's consistent with the conceptual framework. It considered the accounting approach in IFRS 15 and made enhancements and changes accordingly so that it is applicable for public sector transactions. Overall, IPSAS 47 addresses the constituents' concerns and comments received on the existing IPSAS as well as through the overall consultation process. I can see how it could be useful to have one single source of guidance for a topic. So can you go into more detail about what this IPSAS presents? Absolutely. So IPSAS 47 first requires an entity to determine whether its revenue arises from a transaction with a binding arrangement or without a binding arrangement. So essentially, there are two accounting models in this IPSAS. The principles within each of these models will really enable the entity to reflect the substance of its transaction. Okay, so it will be important to determine if there is a binding arrangement. So what is a binding arrangement? Well, the concept is actually quite prevalent already in IPSAS literature, and it's fundamental for revenue accounting in the public sector. A binding arrangement is essentially an arrangement that confers both rights and obligations that are enforceable through legal or equivalent means on the parties to the arrangement. So as you can see, enforceability of the rights and the obligations is a really important assessment here, and it underpins the definition of a binding arrangement. I remember several discussions at the IPSASB meetings and also in other discussions with constituents. What really stood out to me is that an entity must use judgment to consider relevant factors to assess whether enforceability exists, and that enforceability in the public sector can be from legal means or equivalent means. For example, executive authority or ministerial directives. Absolutely. So the terms and conditions of the arrangement, the jurisdiction, the specific transaction itself are all going to be really important for the entity to consider in this assessment. And this really is an important assessment because the enforceability of a right or an obligation within that arrangement will determine the appropriate accounting model to use and also the accounting for the revenue and any related assets or liabilities from that transaction. 
An entity would need to think about the various mechanisms that could provide it the ability to hold the other parties in the arrangement accountable and how it can really compel those parties to complete any of its unfulfilled obligations or face the consequences for not doing so. So what type of transactions would likely be revenue without binding arrangements? A large volume of transactions would likely be revenue without binding arrangements. If you think about an arrangement that is not a binding arrangement, it can really take many forms. So it might be helpful just to talk through some practical examples. One example would be income taxes, where the resource recipient, in this case the government, has an enforceable right to receive resources from the taxpayer but it might not have an enforceable obligation to use those resources to provide a very specific public service to that taxpayer. So an enforceable right, but not an enforceable obligation. Another example could be donations, where the recipient can't make the donor pay them a specific amount of money, but they also might not be required to use the donation uh, received to do something specific. Uh, a last example to provide here would be in a grant, where you as the entity may not be able to force the provider to give you resources as the grant. But once you receive it, you have to use the grant in a certain way. So in that case, you have an unenforceable right, but an enforceable obligation. So an entity would really need to think about the rights and the obligations within that arrangement and determine whether any of its rights meet the definition of an asset and any of those obligations may or may not meet the definition of a liability. Overall, this would inform when an entity recognizes revenue uh, when or as it satisfies any enforceable obligations in the arrangement, or perhaps immediately if there is no enforceable right, but they have an enforceable inflow or right to an inflow. This accounting is essentially consistent with the core principles in Ipsos 23 and with our conceptual framework. So I know that the Asasi staff has released an at a glance that provides more technical issues on the revenue standard, but I did want to ask you about something very specific today. And if you recall back in 2020, I was actually involved with drafting the exposure draft. And back then we used the term performance obligation. And I noticed that the term is no longer in the standard. Can you provide more details about that? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, the IPSASB had several discussions around this, uh, which are summarized in the basis for conclusions in IPSAS 47. Um, and they really tried to consider all the comments received on the exposure drafts in a holistic manner. Essentially, compliance obligations are a culmination of these IPSASB discussions. The IPSASB had noted that performance obligation, which is the term used in IFRS 15 and in ED 70, and present obligations, as it was used in ED 71, represented revenue transactions that had different substances, but were still both intended to be units of account. So they were both mechanisms for revenue accounting to recognize and measure revenue. However, when we boiled it down to the key accounting principles, the accounting principles were actually driven by enforceability, which come from whether or not there is a binding arrangement or not, and whether the rights and obligations within the binding arrangement are enforceable. So the IPSASB decided to use a new term, compliance obligation, to really describe units of account in a binding arrangement in the public sector. Now, compliance obligations are broader than how IFRS 15 has used performance obligations in a multitude of ways. One, compliance obligations are enforceable through not just legal means. Legal means are those that are of judicial means. But within the public sector, there are also equivalent means, which mean they are like legal, essentially. Another difference where compliance obligation is broader is that the recipient of the distinct goods or services in the binding arrangement is not just the customer. So in this case, it would be the resource provider. In compliance obligations, the recipient of the distinct goods and services could actually be the entity itself or a third party beneficiary. Thanks for clarifying. I know the standard has a lot of basis for conclusions that talk about compliance obligations. So I'm sure constituents will have a look if they need more information. Speaking of more information, there's over 200 pages in the standard. Can you talk about why there's so much content here? Yeah, you're right. It's a larger ipsis for sure. And if I step back, I would say the core accounting principles are in about 40, 45 pages. What the board has essentially done is really step back and consider where additional guidance and support would be useful for constituents when they begin applying ipsis 47. 
So that includes application guidance, um, basis for conclusions that explain their decisions leading up to the SIPSIS, and a large amount of non-authoritative guidance in the form of illustrative examples, where there are about 58, as well as implementation guidance, where we have about 13 sets of questions and answers to provide um, that support that would hopefully help entities in applying the principles themselves. Now, this additional support will really encourage entities to use professional judgment when they're applying the accounting principles in IPSIS 47 consistently across the public sector revenue transactions, as there can be some very complex areas, for example, with capital transfers, considering how appropriations may impact the assessment on whether or not elements of the arrangement are enforceable, as well as compelled transactions that may happen in various jurisdictions. Yes, I noticed that IFSAS 47 has a lot of guidance that addresses some of the application issues from the existing IFSAS, so I'm looking forward to see how constituents will apply the standard. So when is it effective? So the effective date of IPSIS 47 is January 1st, 2026, um, and it actually allows entities to adopt earlier. Great. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And thank you for tuning in. You can find additional resources and information at our website at www.ipsasb.org. You may also subscribe to our newsletter or follow us for regular updates. Thank you for listening, and goodbye.